Amen. Well, good morning. We are uh, still rolling through uh, our series on discernment, which is really long, but there's so much in here and uh, so much that we need to know in this season. And uh, I just feel like I've said this over and over and over again, but I'm going to repeat it because it hasn't changed and it's still true. We still need to know it. I feel like this season in America, maybe more than any other, and I don't know if that's true or not, but I feel like it's true that that there's more distractions and more, certainly more information, right? We're, we're overloaded with information. At our fingertips, we can find out the middle name of some bank president CEO's dog, right? Just by Googling something, and we're so connected on media and so disconnected in real life, and I just feel like there's so much, this is maybe too strong of a word, but assaulting us. Just we're bombarded with input. And so if we don't learn to walk in the spirit, we're going to have trouble. And that's true of this time or of a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. We've got to walk in the spirit. So I feel like one of the hindrances to that is because right now all of the things that we'd have to pray extra about, we can just Google right? All of the things that would unintentionally build character in me, well, I've got to wait a week to go to the store. I've got to wait for the series to come out on TV next week, which is, I'm not even pursuing God, but it's in a way building character in me, patience and, and perseverance and, and, you know, faithfulness. It's, it's kind of producing that in me. Now I go on Netflix and I, I watch a whole season in, in one night and can't go to work in the morning because I'm too tired. Right, Joe? I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But, uh, or, or I can pop on Amazon, and it's, it's here in Prime in two days. I don't, I, my life is not geared where I've got to wait for anything. I don't have to, you see what I mean? We're just so bombarded with what I want and how I want it and just this information that why do I need to develop my spirit? So that's just, that's what's stirring in my heart in these last few weeks is if we're not careful, without even doing anything quote-unquote bad, we will have an anemic, underdeveloped, infant spirit. Because life is not set up for us to grow spiritually as it was in the past. And so that's not an excuse it's just a reality. And so that's, that's why we've, we've spent so much time on that. We're going to spend time on it again today. And uh, our hinge verse kind of is Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. For everyone who partakes only of milk, because we're talking about being mature. We're talking about growing up. Ultimately, we're talking about discernment. That's, that's really the heart of this series. But there's so many things that go into it. And so verse 14 says, but solid food is for the who? Mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. And the senses that are being trained there are your spiritual senses. It's your spiritual. Just like you have natural senses, this is all review now, you also have spiritual senses. And if we do not train intentionally our spiritual senses, they won't get trained. You can go through life as a baby Christian and miss out on so much of what God has for you and uh, even be harmful at times to your own self and, and to others. So we want to mature. We want to grow. And so that's what this is kind of talking about. And so spiritual senses. So we thought last week, spiritual senses require a spiritual birth. And so we just, it was a very simple message last time, but it was about you guys, if you are followers of Jesus Christ, you have been born Again, and so we're going we're gonna to just hit the tail end of that, what we were talking about last time as we move on. But this idea, and I think sometimes we forget because we're so familiar with it. You've been born again. You have been born anew. You have something different inside of you, not just a belief system. You haven't just adopted a belief system, right? You have adopted a belief system. Trust me, you need to. 
but you've been, it's more than that. Something is fundamentally different about you now than it was before. You've been born again. Your spirit was dead, and now it's alive. You're not just smarter. You don't just have more knowledge. You didn't like, oh, I found Jesus, and I got a little better in my header, right? You're just, you, it rhymed. It was spontaneous. But you've been born again. Something inside of you that you can't see, touch, or feel, except on the inside, is new now. It's alive where it was not before. Your spirit is full of life now. But it's a baby. Because it's born again. Say born. Born. That's how things start. Born. Right? Think about it. When you, you don't come into the kingdom of God as a mature spirited believer. You come into the kingdom of God as a baby. Not just in what you know, in your spirit, in the development of your spirit. I hope you guys are tracking with me. Some of you guys are like, oh, okay. But I'm just saying, you were spiritually dead. Now that's different. You are now spiritually alive. But when you become spiritually alive, you're a spiritual baby. Not just because, like, I don't, well, I don't, it's not, think about this. It's not like when you go to a company and you're a low man. Anyone ever been the grunt, (laughs) the low man on the totem pole? Yeah, most of you guys have. It's not what we're talking about. Well, I slipped into the kingdom of God, and now I'm just I'm the I'm the spiritual baby now. I'm the I'm just the one that gets the junk jobs and whatever. No, it's not that at all. Like your spirit has just come alive, and it needs to grow in the same way that when you're a baby, you need to grow. And I think we don't ever connect the dots on that. At least I didn't. And so we're learning about spiritual senses and how we can grow in our walk with God. And so we went to John 3 last time, and Jesus answered this question. He said, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He's saying, if you want eternal life, flesh does not inherit eternal life. Spirit does. You, we still live in our flesh. We still walk in our flesh. We skipped the verse that we've had the last couple of weeks about body, soul, and spirit. God has this design in the garden of wholeness, body, soul, and spirit, that, we're, that they're all to be in the right proportion. They're all to be doing the right things. Because of sin, that all got knocked out of kilter. And so God is wanting to restore this, not to sound all weird and like words that have been capitalized by other religions, but just in harmony with how God created us to be. There's a, there's a place for our soul. There's a place for our body. We can't get around without it, right? And our spirit certainly has a place. And we spend so much time on our soul and our body. And church, we forget about our spirit. And so I'm here today to remind you, remember your spirit, Okay, that's my reminder for today. You've got a spirit, and if you haven't grown it, it probably hasn't grown a lot. And so our next verse is is continuing on. In in between these two passages, you know, Nicodemus said, "How, how can that be? What do you mean? What are you telling me? You can't, like I was born once, and I don't really remember that, but I... Like, how can that happen again? I'm, I'm a grown man now. Can you go into your mother's womb? Like, wait, Jesus, tell us what you're really saying here. Jesus said this in verse 7. Don't be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So it is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And that's where we're launching off of today. And we just want to kind of tap into this idea There's phraseology all throughout the New Testament and even in the Old Testament about this flow of God that is to happen in our life. So, number one, we're born again. Our spirit comes alive. And now, number two, there's this, you guys ever heard this scripture about uh, rivers of living water are going to flow out of you? The thing about rivers is they're, the thing that we love about rivers is they're sometimes unpredictable, they're beautiful, they're aesthetic, they're, some places are deep and some are shallow, they're, sometimes they're raging and sometimes they're not. You don't always know where they're going to be at next year. They might cut a new path you know, or erode some of the bank. There's this flowing that happen, happens. There's this flowing, that we, phraseology like fire and wind and, and you know, the, the wind of the Spirit. And here Jesus is saying, 
here's what it's like when you're born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from, and you know where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. He was talking to Nicodemus, who was a teacher of the law, who was filled with knowledge, who was ripe with understanding of the law of God, but ignorant of the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is telling him, look at, look at what he's saying about the wind here. The wind blows where it wishes, okay? The wind is going to go where it wants to go. Now he's talking about pe- people of the Spirit. The Spirit is going to go where the Spirit wants to go. That, our job is to be connected to that leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a will, a desire, a want to, right? The Holy Spirit has a want to. The Holy Spirit is not just a feeling. Remember that whole series on the Holy Spirit? It's not just warm fuzzies. It's not just hot hands. It's not just tingles when I'm worshiping. The Holy Spirit is a person, and he has a a desire for your life, and he wants to be moving throughout your life. So Jesus said, the wind blows where it wishes. He's relating that to the Holy Spirit. Skip over it. Then he says, but you do not know where it comes from, and you do not know where it is going. So... We don't always know what the Holy Spirit's doing in our life. We don't always have figured out what God God has been up to and what he's going to do. Anybody got God all figured out? Okay, I just, like, I wasn't sure. Some of you were a little quizzical. We don't have God figured out. You don't know where the wind came from. You don't know where the wind is going. What do you have access to? Look at what Jesus said. You hear the sound of it. All that you've been given access to is my experience of it right now. I can't, I don't know what, other than looking at history and my own, you know, history, I don't know all what God has done. He hasn't revealed it all to me. I don't know what God has done in hearts where they haven't shared a testimony with me. I don't know where God came from. I don't know, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know unless there's a prophetic thing that he puts in my life, but that's just a minuscule amount. I don't know where where God is going. I don't know where he's moving things except for those few things that he's revealed to us. What I do have is my, right in the middle, my senses, my spiritual senses. You hear the blowing of the wind. You can experience the wind in this moment. Now, this is where it gets dicey because we're a charismatic church and we love the experiential. So that's what I'm going to talk about Trust me, we spent, we spent all that, remember that whole truth series where we can't just be experiential? We've got to be grounded and growing in knowledge, right? Okay, so now I'm going to flip the tables a little bit and we're going to talk about experiential because we need our spirit to grow. We need this flow of God in our lives. And that's what Jesus is saying that is going to happen. And see, he said, don't be amazed that I said to you, he was, Nicodemus is trying to figure it out with his mind. Your mind often will hinder you. Anyone ever, you got some thought in your mind worked out of how this should, should look in my life and whatever and yada yada and then God does something and later on you're like, oh, that's not what I was praying for at all and that's not what I thought should happen. This is way better. Anyone ever had that experience? Anyone, anyone ever look back and been like, if I would have got what I wanted, that would not have been good. Amen. So while we're to be growing in knowledge, while we're to, our soul is to have, part of our soul is our mind, our mind is, is to grow, right? But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the experience of this. And uh, Jesus is saying, you've got this experiential sense of God. You don't get to know where God's been or where he's going. All you've got is whether you're going to pay attention to how the wind is blowing right now. How is the wind blowing right now in your life? Okay? We see this in the Old Testament in Numbers chapter 9. This is Israel after they left Egypt, okay, on their way to the promised land. On the day the tabernacle, the tent of the covenant law was set up, the cloud covered it. Imagine walking out of your tent every morning and seeing the physical cloud of God over the tabernacle. From evening until morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. That's how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night, it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. You see, that was an entire 
community built on following the presence of God. It was an entire community where the cloud goes, I go. When the cloud moves, I move. How many of you guys have any kind of weekly routines at your house? You know, we've got Friday night, family night, our Thursday. So, so Aspen just started working at Three Bean. Where is she at? There you are. So Shauna sent me a message, kind of as a joke, but Thursdays is our day off. And uh, both Marty and I have taken Thursdays off for years. And uh, so we make a big family breakfast. So Thursday mornings is always sleep in, great big breakfast, so then we don't have to eat till supper, and then we work on the house all day. But we always take this big breakfast, and then we watch a, some kind of show or whatever. It used to be a home show and whatever. So Aspen's going to work in the mornings now. And so Shannon said, Aspen's missing breakfast. I'm like, yeah, I know. We're making hash today. Shannon's like, but I said, you're bringing us all some, right? <laughs> so it happened to me one of those days. I've been getting up earlier. And so I had a little bit of extra time. And I told Marnie, I said, I'm going to make breakfast for those guys. And so we cooked up a big pan of hash and threw it in a... Little, threw a little thing in the oven to heat that up and threw that in there and brought it all in. And so brought hash to the girls in town. And I was just thinking about routines. What if you were an Israelite and you just get your hash ready and the cloud lifts? Really, God? <laughs> we're moving today? I just got the luggage put away from last time. And sometimes it was really short and sometimes it was really long. See, you couldn't figure God out. Well, God, I wonder how long, last time we had three weeks. Okay, kids, we had three weeks last time. You wake up the next morning, oh, clouds lifted. Oh, it's only been a day. What happened? It was to train them and to be a foreshadowing for us that we move when he moves. We stay when he stays. We speak when he speaks. We shut up when he shuts up, right? We're to flow with his presence. But if our life is not built around his presence, God's only going to be an inconvenience. If our life is ordered around the presence of God, if we grow our spirits, if we learn to listen to his voice, if we're walking with him, then when we see the cloud lift, you know what we see? We see progress. We see vision. We see journey. You know what, what happens when our lives aren't built around the presence? We see inconvenience. We see my tab timetable is being ruined. We see I'm losing something instead of I'm gaining something. It's an entirely different perspective, and it's a perspective that we get when our spirits aren't built up. When our spiritual senses are not active, when we're not engaging in spiritual activities, we see the presence of God as an inconvenience. We like to use God to make us feel better, and we like to use God to solve problems for ourselves, but he becomes a tool in our toolbox instead of a creator to be praised. We're to build our life around that presence of God. And then when these things happen, we go, well, I'm still sensing your presence. And yet, this is really inconvenient. This is really hard. You must be teaching me something. Thank you, Lord, that we're moving forward. Right? Like you start to see things through the, through the veil of spiritual growth and presence. And this flow. So... Here's a kind of a New Testament version of that. Galatians 5.25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Anyone ever dance with a partner? No one's going to admit it in church. <laughs> Anyone ever have your toes stepped on? Anyone ever trip a little bit? It's a thing of beauty when you watch people gliding across the floor and moving as one. But guess what? There's still one leading. And yet there's two that are moving in this beautiful dance. And then you have Marnie and I. <laughs> Imagine if you duct taped two giraffes together. <laughs> That's kind of what's put on display when we dance. So we mostly just watch other people and are in awe. And we're like, I love you, honey. I love you too, honey. Let's never dance. Okay. <laughs> Except when we're at home. And then our kids laugh. Because, yeah, it really looks like that. But there's this concept of keeping in step. And when we're willing to let the leader of the dance lead, it becomes a thing of beauty. And we get to partake in that. You see, I've still got to show up. I've still got to show up with my will 
with my want to, with, with, you know, if I didn't get any sleep, you know, or whatever, like, like, I still need to do the stuff. I still need to show up. I still need to partner. God isn't just looking for uh, obedient robots. He's looking for partners that walk in full obedience. And there's a difference. God's not just looking for a robotic church that's just full of robotic obedience and, and has no say in the matter. God's looking for a fully obedient church that walks in partnership with him, that has a say in the matter, that shows up, that gets to bring their own ideas and heart and compassion, and yet follows his leading all the time, lets him lead. You guys ever seen some dance partners that maybe got thrown together the first time and uh, they're both used to leading? It doesn't work well. One has to lead. We've got to know our role. And so much anxiety comes in our life when we get the roles switched. When the roles are working, there's peace. There's flow. When the roles are reversed, when we try to lead, it creates anxiety. There will always be a loss of peace when you try to lead. So that's just a little nugget for today. There's peace when we let him lead. And I think one of, one of the reasons we want to keep in step is this verse here. It's John 6, verse 63. It's the Spirit who gives life. What does the Spirit give? Life. life. The Spirit gives life. The flesh is no help at all, or the flesh counts for nothing. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. It is the Spirit who gives life. And so what Jesus is trying to tell us is, the Spirit is what gives life to your spirit, okay? It's eternal, it's immortal, it's full of life, and yet we have the capacity to be out of step and missing out on the flow of God. Anyone ever driven grain truck? Silage truck? Any kind of truck? Used to drive grain truck from or silage truck for my dad. I think if he could have fired me, he would have, but I was all he had, so <laughs> that's what we went with. It was tricky to get that thing lo- lined up where it was supposed to be at, and there was such an importance that if he ever moved, I needed to move. If he backed up, I needed to, well, probably how we were sitting, I needed to go forward. I needed to be in tune with what he was doing because that's where it was coming out. And that's what Jesus is saying here. We need to keep in step with the Spirit because that's where life is. And it doesn't mean that you've lost God or whatever. You've lost the flow that's going to produce life in your life. You've lost the flow, the, the complete flow. You still have got Jesus in your heart. You still got the Holy Spirit in you. But when our lives are out of sync with what he wants to do, Everything requires so much more effort. Everything is so much more difficult. Everything, because then everything is flowing out of our flesh. But when we're synced up with his spirit, there's such a beautiful flow. When we resist that, then it's trouble for us. So we're just kind of laying some more groundwork. We've already kind of went through a little bit of this last time. Let's uh, maybe get into that right now. Um, but just before I leave this, I just want to just really hit this thought that that all of these verses have been talking about is kind of the the following God with our minds versus flowing with his spirit. And there's such a difference. There's such a difference between trying to have God all figured out and yielding to the flow, yielding to that flow of the Holy Spirit. So spiritual senses, a couple weeks ago we talked about touch, I'm just going to give you one verse. Uh, 1 Samuel 10, 26 says, Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. And I don't know if, I don't know if you guys are here or not, but Colton came up front, and, and uh, we walked around together. And all I had to do, and it only took just a little bit for him to figure out what I was doing, and all I had to do was just a little, little tap on, on his back, and he would walk with me. And then when I stopped, he stopped. And then when I went this way, I just kept my hand on his back. He followed me around. And then I, I kind of scarred him emotionally because I said, what you don't have to do is like, ah, 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 
wrong? And so I kind of yelled at him and, move, you need to move. When our spiritual sense of touch is developed, a couple things happen. We become aware of God's presence. See, it correlates to our physical senses. Anyone ever not been paying attention and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, you can sense someone breathing down your neck and you turn around and Junior Paraboom is there? And you're like, whoa. He was my principal in high school. And he, he didn't really have a bubble. I don't know if you guys knew Junior much, but he like his, his way of, of leading was about from right here. And he was not a small guy. I mean, he was intimidating. And uh, so all of a sudden, you just kind of, you'd have this sense that someone's around. And our spiritual sense of touch, if you will, if you'll allow me this, it, it's, it creates an awareness of God's presence. I had, uh, I was going to, I remember I was going to tell you about it, and I'm trying to remember what it was. But I was doing something this week, just in the last couple days, and all of a sudden, I just had this awareness of God's presence. I wasn't praying, I wasn't worshiping, I wasn't reading the Bible, I wasn't, it just, I just went, oh, Lord, you're here. And God's always there. But have you ever had anybody that you loved or that loved you and they just walked by and they just kind of, just kind of did that and just kind of kept walking? Like there's, there's just this signal of I'm, I'm here, I love you, you're special, you're important. We got this. Whatever, so much can be communicated through touch. And I think God sometimes just, he wants us to be aware of something. And then we get to press in and say, God, what do you you want? And then also, the thing that, the way that God speaks to me probably the most is through what I call spiritual nudges. It's not like some of you get, like, where God will speak. And that happens once in a while to me, where God will, like, speak words, you know, in my spirit. And I can hear that. But most often with me, it's just a little nudge. And I really believe that God wants often for us to flow just, if you've been, like Stephen and I, we've worked together for a long time, and so we can, uh, especially playing music, but a lot of times when we go places and play or whatever, we'll just look, oh, you, John said to me the other day, I saw, you, I saw you look at Marnie and then you looked at Stephen, and then you just guys, you guys switched and you went to the chorus, so when you look at them, does that mean you're going to the chorus? I said, well, no. In some songs, it means we're going to the bridge. He's like, oh. In other ones, it means we're going to stop now. He's like, oh. But it's not the same song every time. He's like, oh? <laughs> There's no, it's, it's, that's what I would classify as a nudge. It's, it's this little, it's, we, we're so familiar with what we're sensing and wanting to happen that, and sometimes we completely misinterpret it, but Probably 95 times out of 100, we'll, we'll get it right, and, and we kind of know where everyone's wanting to go, and we just, we look, and it's a, right? Okay, yep, and that's all that gets said, and I think God wants to communicate just through this nudge sometimes. You know, you know what you've been reading in the scripture? Yeah, that's right there, that one, yep, and there's this little nudge where he doesn't have to scream to get our attention, where we become just looking and listening and and waiting for his touch on our heart and spirit. So that's one way. So it's we develop that by spending time in his presence. We develop that by intentionality. We we have to want to learn to sense his presence. Uh, We develop that in worship, in prayer, in in doing the spiritual things, fasting sometimes, getting things broke off our life like we did this morning, just that could be stopping that up. And so we can become more sensitive to those kind of things. You can grow in that. You can grow in that. I just want to encourage you today. All of these things you can grow in. That the kind of the given, the underlying thing that is true for all these, you can grow in them. And I think so often we don't mature as Christians because we haven't we haven't developed any of our spiritual senses. We just think that stuff is weird or whatever. And yet that's a normal way of how God wants to interact with our lives. So today, the last little bit that we have, spiritual sense of taste. <laughs> There's a yeah, really. I know, you guys are looking at me pretty funny. Just wait, we'll get into that. A fun fact. Your mind can imagine what something tastes like just by picturing it. Think of yourself licking that chair. Like, really do it. Think of yourself. Like, I did this in my house. I, I bet it was easily 20 or 25 things, probably more like 50 things. And, like, you can actually feel the texture of what's Like, your brain has got enough information in there that you can feel what something tastes like just by licking it. I'm trying to imagine what you guys are licking in your mind right now. 
It is a bizarre, a bizarre thing how God wired us up like that. But I, I just I could not find anything that I that I don't feel was pretty accurate because I've had a lot, a lot of things in my mouth over the years for whatever reason. I've been a baby, and I remember that. Not really. But uh, the verse that you're probably all thinking of is Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And the thing about taste is it goes beyond touch. It's more intimate than touch. You see, this, this zone right here is kind of where, where my superintendent would kind of hang out in. We all kind of have a, even before COVID, <laughs> there's, a, there's a safe space where you're like, no, too close. Like, like from here to here is reserved for my kids and my wife, right? You know, like, like there's, a, there's a spot in front of your face that is intimacy. We talked about that when we talked about seeking the face of the Lord. So there's this, there's this physically, when, when you get right here, too close. Like, like it, we're uncomfortable with that. Right? What happens, what happens when you get in a fight? What does someone do? Get, like we, that's, what, that's what we call it. That's physically what happens. But if it happened on social media and someone said, yeah, they got in my face and, but, you know, on Facebook, you would know what they meant by that. It's, it's violating your intimacy. Well, where does food go? I mean, it's, it's more than touch. Touch can be out here. I mean, like, Oh, yeah, smooth, right? Taste, I've got to ingest that. I've got to come closer. It's got to be by invitation only, unless someone's force-feeding you. But the, but the invitation is here, is here for you. You taste and see that the Lord is good. That means you've got to approach God. I can't, approach, I can't taste and see that the Lord is good from far off. Oh, yeah, good burger over there. Boy, I really like that. Mm, thumbs up. Like, you don't know that unless you get closely acquainted with it. And David is just kind of issuing this invitation to come close. No, closer. No, closer. No, closer. No, guys, you're not getting it. Closer. Hey, come closer. No, Come closer, intimately closer to the Lord because it's only from that distance that you can see in your spirit that he's good. And that's where you're going to find a refuge in him. Not far off, but near. And so this idea of taste, like I get to participate in that. I get to ingest that. Not that we eat God, but... but Funny enough, kind of right in that section that we were at in earlier, I think it's in John 6, I think. It's where Jesus is saying, you got to eat of me. You got to eat my flesh, drink my blood. Like, or you have no part of me. You've got, like, you've got to be close. Thank you, Joe, for being our theologian for the day. The, the tech guy is failing. At least the theologian guys are doing their job. <laughs> so let's look at this quick. Let's look at something that happens with food. We're going to look at the, in the physical realm. Food brings enjoyment. Who gets excited every once in a while to go out and eat? A few of you? We went, my kids all said uh, all through the summer uh, for COVID, you know, because everything was closed down or whatever. They kept saying, sorry, I'm using you guys a lot today, but you're great examples of humanity. And uh, they said, our dream is to go to Texas Roadhouse and Cold Stone. So when this is all over, when we finally get to go out again, so for family night, we ran up and, and uh, got some school supplies. We went to Fargo, and we went to Texas Roadhouse and had medium rare sirloins with blue cheese crumbles on top and steak fries and salads. And then we went to Cold Stone and dove into ice cream. Larry, you're shaking your head. Are you okay back there? It was so good. Aspen said afterwards, Dad, that ice cream from Cold Stone, it's, it's sticky. I said, yeah, I, I finally figured it out. It, they, they, they keep it so cold, and they mix that syrup in it, and it just creates 
this paradise that you can't get at home, no matter what you put in your ice cream. And it's so good, and it's so rich, and it's so yummy. And then we got Starbucks, and we drove home, and we was, we we're so happy. <laughs> we we're so happy. But it brings enjoyment. And if, and if you know Callie at all, she, she's about the Cheerios, man. <laughs> just give me the food. I don't care whatever else is going on. Just give me, give me Cracker, Cracker, Eos, Cracker, Eos, <laughs> Cheerios. Or she likes meat. Meat is good, too. <laughs> She's decided meat is good. So if food brings enjoyment. I know it does to you as well. Come on. It creates connection. You ever notice that Jesus spent a lot of his life eating? I shared that one time with a family counselor, a uh, guy that I know, and we were talking about that. And uh, he was just, you know, talking about my job as a pastor and, and his job as a counselor or whatever. And, and uh, I said, well, you know that, I said, one of the things that we talk about in any of our counseling things or whatever is how important mealtime is because it creates connection. And he just looked at me. What do you mean? I said, well, think about it. Think of, think of when you eat, Jesus knew this. Jesus knew that when you gathered around a table, for some reason, defenses come down. Your heart begins to open up and you start connecting. You start talk, if, if, you're, if you're diligent about it and, and don't just talk about dumb stuff, like you start to talk about things that you wouldn't normally otherwise because you've got something to, you're ingesting. It's this, it's this idea of intimacy again. So it creates connection. It creates that beautiful thing. It creates defining moments. Savannah, Georgia is a little train car and it's called Sandfly Barbecue. And they make food that nearly brings on the rapture. It is that good. I just, I, I, this theologian guy, you're going you're gonna to have to correct me. But I mean, it could, I might not be correct, but I feel like Jesus is peering and he's going, now, Father? Like, like, I know, I know. That's a little too much, isn't it? But I feel like that. And, it, and we, uh, our family, just, we went off on this crazy trip about five or six years ago, thought we would hate it. It was the weirdest thing we've ever done. We've never, we could never even make it to Rapid City, and we ended up going to 17 states in one trip and just about 5,000 miles and, and uh, found out that we loved it. And so we've done all the states now. And so on our, on our barbecue tour, we went to 14 different barbecue places. And in Savannah, Georgia, with the moss hanging down and sweaty legs, we went into this barbecue place, and we had a moment that our family is going to remember for the rest of their lives. We did more than have a meal. We created a moment in history that we shared, and we talk about all the time now. It creates a defining moment, food does. How many of you remember a Christmas dinner from when you were kids? How many of you remember a, a family meal? How many of you remember something called the Last Supper? Huh. It sustains and nourishes us. Food gives us strength. Food uh, helps our body do what it needs to do, make the energy that it needs to make, let our brains think clearly. You know, if our, if our nutrients get off, our body gets out of whack, and so we need to eat the right food and all that kind of stuff. And the fifth thing that I have, food brings comfort. <laughs> Maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's an idol. Let's, we'll just pretend that none of that exists. But, you know... It does bring comfort. You know, after a long day, you sit down with a cup of coffee or a, or a piece of, of strawberry rhubarb pie. or It does give you big bellies. But comf comfort as well. <laughs> it does give you big bellies. And there's so many times. Have you ever heard the story about uh, the Israelites when they left Egypt? They were scared. They were out of their element. They thought God had not come through on his end of the bargain. What did they want? Leeks. Yeah, leeks and garlic. Give me some food to bring me some comfort. I'm not saying that's right. I'm saying it's something that happens. Now let's flip this over to our spiritual man here, our spiritual sense of taste. If we begin to develop an appetite for the things of God, what if we get enjoyment from the Lord. I put this, well, I was going to do a slide for all these, but I knew I'd run out of time. Uh, what is the chief end of man? This is in the Westminster Shorter Catechism of, 19, of 1646. 
Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And I, I so see that in the scripture. I so believe that it's true, that we get off kilter when our primary, say primary, primary, when our primary source of enjoyment comes from things other than God. Now, God has given us all things for our enjoyment. That's scriptural. But when our primary source of enjoyment comes from something besides God, that's when we get in trouble. What about creating connection? This sense of taste, this spiritual sense, creates this longing for a connection with God. And so when I begin to dine with him, when I begin to spend time with him, it lets down my walls. And I start sharing my heart with God, and I start hearing from him about his heart for me. It creates defining moments. Letting our appetites, letting our, our taste for the things of God. I mean, Joe, how many... I'm using you a lot today because you only come around once in a while. So... So I'm just going to, I'm going to, yep, exactly, exactly. Thank you for doing that. Your self-sacrifice is, is legendary. Yeah. Tara, you married a good man there. True story. I mean, I'm sure you've had at IHOP, have had just amazing defining moments. <laughs> well, it's true. There's, there's a couple. There's the pancake one and there's the Jesus one. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. And when, when our hearts are hungering for the things of God, when we have a, an appetite, when we have a taste for the things of God, it creates these moments. It lets us be in places in the right heart and mindset so that when God shows up, we can look back. A lot of you can look back at times in your life when you've been hungry for God and you're like, wow, what God did in that month or that six months or that one night, that's, that's with me today. That's a, that's a defining moment. We have one when we went out to Chicago uh, Marnie and I and Stephen and Trisha, man, it just marked us forever. And we, I mean, we're just not the same since then. That was 10 years ago and uh, eight years ago. And it just, like those moments define you, sustains and nourishes us. What did Jesus say when they found him with the Samaritan woman? And they're like, oh, did you eat? And he said, no. He said, I've got food that you don't know anything about. God sustains us. When we hunger, when we partake of him, when we ingest him, when we get closer, there's a sustaining that happens in our spirit. And the last one, comfort. I mean, that's an obvious one, right? Yeah. The Holy Spirit, one of the names of the Holy Spirit is the comforter, right? Okay, so I shouldn't have to peel that one open for you guys. We're just going to end with that. But just let's let our spiritual appetites be wet for the thing of, things of God. And as long as we're getting all of our appetites met in the flesh, it's harder for our spirit to have any room to have appetites. So sometimes you need to do things that are drastic. You need to do things like fasting. You need to do things like pulling yourself away for a little bit. You need to have a Sabbath. You need to go maybe on a retreat. You may, you know, you think some of that's just for spiritual people. And I'm not one of those spiritual people. <laughs> yeah, because you don't do those things. <laughs> chicken and the egg. Well, it's the chicken in this case. You like we need to do the things, and it creates this appetite in us. It creates this hunger for the things of God. So my prayer today is that the sense of taste that we would our appetites. Dwight, oh, one of his famous lines was, you know, I want. To, I just want to give you a spiritual saltine cracker, so that you'll just get thirsty for the things of God. And that's my prayer for you as well today. Our spirits need to grow, and when they do, we're going to thrive. And when they do, the kingdom's going to grow. Amen? Yeah.